before I start, I will just say that I do have a stutter, which sometimes causes me to have breaks in my speech, so please bear with me on that. I'd also like to note that Rowan has almost kind of lost his voice, so <laughs> this <laughs> might be kind of interesting, so just bear with us. We can use sign language. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or dance. Yes. <laughs> but I'd like to say uh, thanks, uh, thanks to all for coming along and contributing to the session. And in the introduction, we're sort of going to uh, uh, really just talk a little bit about sort of how we arrived at wanting to do this session and a bit of our background. So trying to explain why there are two guys from Northern Ireland who have an interest in the central uh, in the uh, in a scientific dating in the central and western Mediterranean history, history, and then to give a bit of a background of the kind of work which we were doing, which kind of informed this session, and hoping that that might be able to direct some of the uh, some of the discussion that we have. So yes, and then we also talked about a bit of, sort of housekeeping admin as well. So all right. So really. Uh, as you guys might have been able to tell from uh, from the title, it was loosely based off this volume, which we're very happy to have both of the editors mm -hmm. here. So again, this is sort of again something which, uh, whenever Rowan and I began to work with some of this, we were drawn to this volume and thought it was very important in how it brought together and synthesized uh, um, and, uh, and tried to really uh, provide an update on the central uh, A central database for uh, radiocarbon dating in uh, Italian prehistory, but really sort of impacting on the wider central Mediterranean. And this is sort of again 25 years since the foundation of the or, or, or since the EAA, but also 25 years since the publication of this book. So we thought it would sort of work to do together. Yeah, I'm very sorry to remind <laughs> you of that. Um, so what we wanted to do was sort of give a quick overview of the contributions before then moving on to talk about well the state of the art as we see it. So we've together over the last year have um, tried to update this database by sort of gathering together uh, many of the radiocarbon dates that have been pr produced since. So we're going to talk a little bit about the coverage and some about uh, and then Roman's going to talk a little bit about sort of uh, some of our uh, or some of the methods which he's developed and how we've been approaching the, the, the data set and then moving on to then uh, the session proper. So <coughs> yes, um, so this is sort of just a bit of a general idea of what we're dealing with. We have some papers that sort of deal with broader regions. I think Rowan might have maybe changed the nature of all this talk, so this might be a little less oh, relevant. Oh yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this gives so this gives you an idea of what we're working on. So, um, so the first talk is being given by Ruth Whitehurst, which is great again because we're getting this. Uh, we're getting this overview of the impact that radiocarbon dating has had on central Mediterranean prehistory um, over the course of Ruth's career, which is super. We're then going to uh, move on. We're, Rowan's going to talk um, his, his talk entitled Four Interesting Chronological Problems for Central and Western Mediterranean Prehistory. So talking about some broad, some broad issues and some uh, um, and things which he is identified over the last few years of working with someone. We're then going to have a discussion slot and during the discussion slot it would be great if we could get the previous speakers up towards the front so then we can sort of have a bit of a better uh, to and fro. After the discussion we're going to move on uh, to a talk by Mark Pierce and Roberto Maggi um, on the radiocarbon chronology of the earliest Neolithic of West, Central and Northwestern Italy. Um, we're then going to move on to uh, excuse me. We're going to move on to a talk by uh, excuse me. I don't uh, <laughs> yeah, by Cristiano, which will be covering the uh, which will be discussing a new radiocarbon based sequence for early Italian metalwork. Um, after that, we'll then move on to a talk by myself, which will be talking about rock cut tunes of the central Mediterranean. We will then have another discussion slot and then we'll be then going down to Sicily where we'll have a discussion from Domenico Gulli on radiocarbon evidence from the Agrigento territory. Um, and then we're going to move all the way over to we're going to move all the way over to Bronze Age Serbia and 
we're going to have a um a, a talk led by could you actually uh, could you, you identify yourself who's talking on yes um, um Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I knew I wasn't going to get something. So, yeah. And then, and then, um, before then, it's ending on the talk by Jonathan Santana, where we jump all the way down to just sort of on the very sort of edge of what we're talking about. But I think there's still a really important case to be to bring in in terms of thinking of island archaeology. Uh, a talk titled "Going into the Deep Blue Sea: New Insights into the Colonization of the Canary Islands in Antiquity." So that's just a bit of an overview of the session contents. And now we're going to move on to the state of the art. If we could, would you like to take this? Yeah, I mean, this session we conceived of as a kind of uh, a, a big launch pad for a, a big paper that we both wrote um, that we thought might be published by now, but uh, it's still under review. Uh, so, you know, we can't really uh, do that per se, but we put all this data together for, for this big publication. And our database, uh, we try to get all the radiocarbon dates from the from the region together in one spatio-temporal database and just analyze it to see what sort of patterns emerge. Uh, and it's a, it's a fresh synthesis so we can both Italy and uh, the sort of south <coughs> eastern corner of France and Malta. So uh, how many dates do we have? Can you remember? It's, it's about 4,000. So there's about 4,000 radiocarbon dates in this database. And so we analyze them. Uh, you know, spatially, we can plot out their distribution to look at where the most densely sampled parts of the landscape are. And then we've been also, methods that I've been developing over the last few years, <coughs> coming from Ireland, where we have this vast radio carbon, uh, you know, like data set here, and indeed there's lots of uh, the richly sampled landscapes of Northern Europe with their huge radio carbon databases. We wanted to do a kind of inter-regional comparison to see what the, what the trends in this overall scale, this overall the overall weight of data actually tell us about the uh, the dynamics of the past. And to do that, we use this technique called the uh, kernel density estimation uh, that produces these squiggly lines. And what these squiggly lines are, it's a bit like a histogram. So uh, if you imagine that the area under these squiggly lines is the relative amount of dates that we have. And from these time series, it's a bit like looking at the price of stocks or shares in the stock exchange or or you know, population numbers or whatnot, but it tells us, at least at a very basic level, how well sampled the archeological uh, landscape is at any one point in time, or how well dated it is, I should say. And then you can begin to unpack that. You can say, is this because of where research interests are? Is this because of where the sites are best preserved? Or is this simply an artifact of the underlying demographic trend of the past, the, the population? And uh, in our paper, we discuss this and, you know, come up with all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, ideas about the explanations as to why this may be so. But I suppose our point is that we can achieve this big overall general synthesis. Uh, I want to just show you a map of how all this data that, you know, that fundamentally we're going to be talking about in this session actually plays out, if I can do this. Um, Oop. Yes. So this is this is what happens if you plot a map of the uh, central Mediterranean and and just sort of <clears throat> look at it at each time slice and look at where all the radiocarbon dates are. So you see here in the Mesolithic period, there's a rather the uh, sparsely sampled landscape with the reasonably well-known Mesolithic sites. Yeah, so I'll reconfigure this guy's computer. The uh, mushroom of the... You know, so th this is a familiar aspect of Mesolithic hunter-gatherer archaeology everywhere. There's no real uh, easily recognizable pattern that, that um, exists spatio-temporally until really we get into the Neolithic, which is about the which is about to appear, jump over from the Balkans. Uh, here it comes. There we go. So, you know, these are the early Neolithic sites of, uh, of southern Italy, the sort of impressed pottery traditions. Uh, it really becomes a lot more widespread as we get into the, what, the sixth millennium, occurring all over the peninsula. It jumps down to Malta right now. 
and uh, you can see where the where the just the sort of the, the northern movement and these patterns are well documented and it's something that you know plays out as we look at all the maps or look at all the frames of the animation as we get into the copper age uh, there's various you know richly sampled sites and parts of the landscape that are well known and then as we get into the bronze age there's the great intensification and you know the pro plane and you see the you know the huge uh, um, What's also very interesting is that you can actually visualize really nicely um, in the Bronze Age the, the shift, the shift from the margins of the Alps, the big Colada settlement, then down on to the Po Valley, the, the Terra Mare, and you can really see that shift in this map. And again, that's what's so yeah. exciting about this kind of approach and that it allows us to sort of really visualize some of these important shifts in settlement. So methodologically, it's quite a departure from the sort of, you know, what's gone before. It's a slightly new way of modeling the data and thinking about the trends inherent to them. And, uh, and then it's sort of as the Iron Age goes on, the, the, really the amount of radiocarbon data that they have just starts to dwindle away because, well, partly because it genuinely does dwindle away and partly because uh, there's, we sort of relaxed our particular pressure of research. But this is, I mean, this is still early days for these sorts of techniques. Um, uh, I think really our purpose of showing you this was to just demonstrate that this is an incredibly rich and uh, uh, multi-dimensional data set that, that you know will certainly keep us occupied for years to come and unpicking its nuances. So I think really uh, that's all we want to say by way of an introduction to the session and an introduction to the to the data set that is out there.